Greetings. My name is Dr. Erica Buchanan Rivera, and I am the Director of Equity Inclusion for Washington Township Schools. We are very excited to have you join us this evening for our Learning and Community Webinar Series. Our District Equity Leadership Team started the series last year to create a space where Washington Township staff and families could come together and share learning experiences that centered educational equity and inclusion. We are thrilled to have Dr. Tracy Baxley with us this evening who is the author of Social Justice Parenting, How to Raise Compassionate, Anti-Racist, Justice-Minded Kids in an Unjust World. Dr. Tracy Baxley is a professor, consultant, parenting coach, speaker, mother to five children, and she has degrees in child development, elementary education, and curriculum and instruction, as well as over 30 years of experience in education. She specializes in belonging, diversity, and inclusion, anti-bias curriculum, and social justice education. She will initially discuss principles from her book, and then will be a part of a parent-to-parent -parent dialogue with members of our community coalition to engage in a conversation around how we center humanity in our conversations with you. Therefore, she will be joined by coalition members Shante Barnes and Dr. Ryan Flessner, who will ask more questions. We are so looking forward to Dr. Tracy Baxley talking about the principles of social justice parenting. The next part of social justice parenting is this idea of creating core values. Core values are really the centering beliefs of our families. It's the foundation for our why for the reason we wake up in the morning, right? The things that we do for our kids um, are all centered around these core values. And I also see core values as kind of like our GPS, right? So that when we get off track, when we're doing things that don't align with who we really are and, and the way we want to raise our children, our core values, um, leaning into those core values really can get us back to center, right? Get us back to the things that matter the most for us and the things that we want our children to leave our homes with um, being a part of who they are. And I think every family should create three to five core values that become really the legacy for your, for your family and for your home. And they should be talked about often. They should be written on the refrigerator. They should be embedded in everything that you guys do so that your children are really clear about what those core values are. Oftentimes we assume our kids know what's important to us, but unless we are um, explicitly saying it constantly and intentionally. Um, sometimes our children may not know exactly what, what's important to us as a family. And getting kids involved in creating those core values is even more, um, more, more dynamic. Um, the, the last uh, big idea that I wanna touch on before we get into the rocks, which is, are the foundational pieces, is this idea of active hope. And I think active hope is something that we do, right? It's not just wishful thinking. It's something that we, we plan around. It's something that we create actions around. And sometimes it means um, taking steps even when we're afraid. Um, and it's teaching our children that we don't have to have the, all the answers when we wanna start something, but that we are leaning into our faith. We're leaning, leaning on compassion, goodwill, and that we, um, want things to change. And by wanting things to change, we have to create some action around that. And then finally, I wanna just touch on each of the rocks. So the rocks are really the foundational part of social justice parenting. And rock stands for reflection, open dialogue, compassion, kindness, and social engagement. Now, when we look at the rocks, we look at them through these three lenses, the lens of self, right? How am I doing these things for and with myself? How am I showing up in terms of these rocks with my family? What am I teaching my children? What are we doing as a household, right? Those core, going back to those core values. And then how is my family showing up in the community and the world around us? So as you examine the rocks, think about it from these three different lenses. The R is reflection. It's sometimes the thing that parents wanna skip, but it's really the most important because sometimes it's hard work. We have to really think about our own ways of thinking, our own ways of being, our own childhood experiences, sometimes our own traumas, right? To really um, be intentional about the way we wanna show up for our children. So 
Sometimes that means unlearning some of the things that we learned in our own childhood so that we can show up differently for our own children. So reflection is really key to social justice parenting and it's really key for us growing as human beings um, the way we want our children to also do. The second one is O, which is open dialogue. And this is uh, where we are encouraging ourselves to have those hard conversations with their children. And that means sometimes we have to be in a vulnerable space. Sometimes it's a space where we have to say that we don't know the answers. And I think our children grow when we tell them that we don't know the answers because it helps them see that they don't have to have the answers too. Um, I think when we talk about open dialogue, we're talking about speaking and listening with that idea of active hope and humility. And it's also giving other people the space to to be able to tell their truths, even when it's different from ours. So I always get the question about what age, when should I start? And I always say that children are never too young to have open dialogue, right? We just have to do it in a way that is age appropriate, that it's done with compassion and kindness, but that it really leans into their curiosities and not lean into the fears that we sometimes bring as parents. The C is for compassion. And uh, sometimes that starts with that, that lens of self, right? Giving ourselves grace. I know sometimes I have that mean girl chattering away in my head often when I'm parenting. And so um, when I don't get it right, I try to make sure I lean into the idea of self-compassion, right? Giving myself grace when I don't do the right thing. It also, compassion also means prioritizing all the voices and the feelings of not just your family, but the people uh, around you in the community so that you are not centering yourself, right? So that we are hearing what other people's lived experiences are and the way that they view the world. And I think it's also about how we show up and how we take action and how we acknowledge that there's pain and there's hurt from others and how we can lean into that to um, create safe spaces for others. And then the K is for kindness. Um, and I define kindness as compassion and action. So it's how we can kind of produce these waves that go beyond our really our understanding and our own consciousness. There's studies that show that even people who witness kindness, they don't even have to be involved in the act, that they, they have the same endorphins, right? The same um, serotonin that goes off in the brain, those happy um, feelings they get the same feelings, even if you're just witnessing it. So how do we lean into the idea of being a facilitator for more kindness? And how do we foster a community where people feel like they belong and they matter and they're, va and they're valued? And how are we teaching our children to do that? And then the S is social engagement. So it's about acknowledging that we all have privileges and we all have areas of marginalization. Talk about what those are. Talk about how they're different for your family and other families. And also talk about how they may be different within family members, right? So um, you may be in the same family, but you may have some privileges and some marginalizations that are different. So unpack that with children, talk about it, because it's really the first step into letting children see that they can make a difference out in the world. So social engagement is really about creating safe spaces of belonging. You can start that in your home and then that should um, vibrate out into the world. Um, how are we creating safe spaces? How are we creating more inclusive spaces? How are we standing up being allies for people who are different from us? And how are we allowing ourselves and, and, and encouraging our children to really um, act upon their intellectually curious behaviors, when they wanna ask those questions, when they wanna do something and it, we may not feel it safe because of our own fears, but allowing ourselves to give them the freedom to do some of those things. And then I think in doing that, we really start to assist our children to develop their own sense of social justice engagement that will become part of who they are as they move out into the world. So just a re quick recap, the ROCs stand for reflection, open dialogue, compassion, kindness, and social engagement. And I think if we can start thinking about how we do that as a community, then we really can start to um, make ripples in the world and make some changes uh, for, the, for the better.
Thank you so much for that information from your book, Dr. Baxley. Um, first and foremost, I want to tell parents, if you haven't had the opportunity to read a book, please read the book. And additionally, um, Dr. Baxley is the person reading the audio on the audio book. Um, so I really love listening to her voice. It made me feel like I was listening to another parent um, that's trying to raise kids just like she is. Um, one of the questions I had um, when reading this book was how do you as families, how can you be proactive in engaging in um, activities that promote justice within your home, within with your family members, and then when you go outside of your home, out in the community? Yeah, I, th I think it, it looks different for each family, but there are some common characteristics that really kind of support this idea of what I call pro-justice homes. Um, and the idea of creating a home that is intentional and consistent um, is really the key. And in my book, I use this analogy that I know a lot of you guys may have kids that play sports, play instruments, or do things that require lots of practice, right? And I think um, in my son's ba bathroom, one of the quotes we have on their bathroom wall is, you play the way you practice. And so when we show up in our homes in a way that we're teaching our kids to show up for others, I think it's really the start of how we can translate what we're doing in, in our homes into uh, the uh, community. And so when I talk about characteristics, right, that are pro-justice. I, I think it starts with this idea of our daily practices and routines that are really grounded in the lives of all of our kids. And that requires us to really getting to know our kids. Uh, sometimes we want to parent our kids from the things we had or didn't have or who we thought our kids are going, were going to be. Um, and sometimes we get kids that we didn't know that we needed. And so I think really making sure that all the um, things that you're doing in our homes are grounded, grounded in the lives, the interests, and the experience of the kids that are in your house, right? So getting to know who they are. I think another characteristic is that there is examples and evidence of empathy, compassion, and decision-making um, with others in mind, right? A concerted effort to think about others. So when you're having your uh, conversations with your children, are we doing it from the lens of how would this impact somebody else? What do you think they were thinking? Um, another characteristic, I think, is the idea of always being reflective. Again, that's the one that we sometimes, it's hard for us because we have our own lived experiences and sometimes our um, traumas live in that space. So creating a home where it's reflective and there's a lot of dialogue going on. So conversations, connections, and collaboration are really important. And then the final thing I think is really this idea of accountability. So how are we holding each other accountable about what we say, what we do? Um, I know in my house, one of our core values is own your own junk. And that's our way of um, keeping everybody accountable that you have to think about it in issues in terms of how did what you do, what you did impact the people around you before you can just kind of tell me your perspective. So I think if we're doing those things in our homes, both intentionally and consistently, those ripples into the world will be evident um, the minute your children kind of step out of your home. I have a, a kind of a related question, but before we do that, I just want to remind everyone who is on the webinar that if you have questions for Dr. Baxley, you can also put those in the chat and we will be monitoring that throughout the course of the conversation. We can uh, throw some of your questions in as well, but um, you talk a lot in your book and you give a lot of advice uh, for parents. But one thing I think is really brave is that you also share some of the missteps that you made. Can you talk a little bit about why it was important for you to just drive home that message over and over again? Don't be afraid of getting it wrong. Yeah, I, I really think when we start to make the mistakes, it's really the only way we can grow, right? If we stay comfortable in our own space, doing what's easy, doing the things that we know. As human beings, we, we don't grow. And we, we, we push our children to, to go outside of their comfort zone often, but we sometimes don't wanna do that for ourselves. So I think if we don't reflect on these practices as, as parents or the way that we show up as allies, really, um, I think it's, it's a, it's an, op their opportunities missed. And um, it was important for me to be 
open and honest and vulnerable when writing the book because that's what I'm asking. That's what I'm asking the reader to do. That's what I'm asking you to do. And I, I'm also a big uh, kind of village parent, right? This idea of us in this thing together and that we can't do it alone. And so I think in order for us to show up as our best selves, um, especially as parents, there could be a lot of judgment. There could be a lot of shame and loneliness in that, you know, when we make mistakes or the fear of making mistakes. And I didn't want any parent to feel like they were alone in those mistakes or there was law alone in decisions that they made that uh, on uh, in reflecting that they weren't great decisions. So um, I think finding community and finding forgiveness in all of those challenges is really important. And so I, when I started writing the book, I, I said that I really wanted to do that um, from a place of honesty and, uh, and, and telling my truth. Now I will say this, I did go to my children um, as I wrote stories about them and said, is this okay with you? Um, and there's a couple of stories that didn't make, make the book because they didn't feel comfortable with that. So I think also making sure that my children, my husband, my family also felt um, comfortable with me telling their stories too. So in telling my story, I'm telling theirs. But I think it's important that we surround each other and uplift each other and really, um, again, come from this space of we can't grow if we don't push ourselves to make mistakes. And, it, and in activism too, right? We, if we stay comfortable where we are, things won't change. So I always say, we, if you're trying to do some social um, justice work or some uh, activism work or allyship, that you should always be on that kind of bubble of um, being comfortable and being uncomfortable and pushing yourself. And when you start to feel comfortable, it means you've done growing at that stage and you need to push yourself a little bit more. Speaking about being uncomfortable, there's a part in the book that you say um, that um, parents should not be afraid to ride shotgun for another parent. Um, and sometimes as a parent, I mean, we're talking at the bus stop, we're talking at school events, and you'll hear a concern for another parent. And so you're wondering, like, how, what is the best way that I support this parent, because um, sometimes it's a tricky um, element. So could you elaborate a little bit more on what you mean when you say that sometimes we need to go and ride shotgun? Yeah, I, again, I'm a big proponent of village parenting because I think we can only create a world where everybody feels like they belong and everybody seems to feel seen and heard and valued um, if we're involved in each, in each other's lives. So it's easy to parent in isolation sometimes or have these inner circles that are really work as kind of um, echo chambers, you know, in our own lives uh, or to put our heads down and really just kind of do what's best for my kid. But I think when I when I write that we need to be riding shotgun, I really think it means that we we owe ourselves, right, to support each other, right? And, I, and um, when we're parenting, if we're only parenting from a lens of our own kids, and to me, I think it's almost selfish parenting. Um, we can't change things and we can't make others feel safe about changing things. And sometimes, you know, sometimes parents just need, you know, just a hand on the back to say you're doing a good job or I see you or I know it's a hard day. Um, and that's all sometimes it takes to run shotgun. I, I was um, being interviewed for a podcast a couple of years ago and the host of the podcast, who was a white woman, said to me, we're talking about, you know, having the talk with my boys and talking about the things that uh, I needed to tell my kids for them to feel, to be safe in the world and the things that I needed them to know as young black boys growing up in this racialized world. And she said to me, I feel so, and she meant it sincerely and she had great compassion for me, that I feel so sorry that you have to talk to your boys about this and I don't. Right. So if we're really going to write shotgun or we're really going to stand in the gap or stand in allyship, you do need to have those conversations with your with your kids, even if that particular um, inequity or marginalization don't impact you directly. Right. If we're all in this together and the responsibility of of um, raising children who stand up for others 
we have to create an environment where we are standing in the gap for other people too. So I think riding shotgun just means that we have to see each other, acknowledge each other and support each other in this whole parenting journey. There's a great question that's related in the chat from one of the Washington Township teachers, um, Lisa Harden from Springville, Springville Elementary. Um, and she asks uh, kind of this idea of it takes a village, right? And she says, how do we prepare our children to share space with other children who may hold and reflect viewpoints that don't align with equity or social justice? Yeah, that is a really great question, um, Lisa. Thank you. I, I think part, I shouldn't say, okay, I usually say or, it's not an or, it's an and. I think teaching our kids to be compassionate and kind is very important. We also have to teach them to be compassionate and, comp and, and kind, even when people's views are different from there. So how, what does that look like, right? You allowing people to have their say, right? Being a good listener, being active in your listening, um, being open and engaged, open-hearted, open-minded, right? Um, and then also allowing, asking for space to be able to tell your, your, um, your perspective. I also tell parents that we do pretty good at teaching our kids kindness and compassion, but what we sometimes forget to do is actively teach our children to hold boundaries, right? It's okay that people don't agree. It's okay to listen to them when they don't agree. It's okay to ask them, can I tell you my perspective? Let's listen to it from my perspective. But when your children feel like they are physically threatened, when they are, their mental health is threatened, it's okay to create boundaries. And when you're creating these boundaries, we are actively showing children what that looks like. So you're role-playing it, right? You're modeling it for them. I, I call it um, uh, back pocket talk, where I give my children three or four things to say if this scenario happens. Because sometimes in the moment, even as adults, right? We, somebody says something to us and we kind of freeze. And then later on that night, you say, oh my God, I should have said that. Um, so giving kids some back pocket talks where they already have in their back pocket and they already know how to react or respond to things that when they don't feel safe or when somebody says something that's offensive, that they can still be kind of compassionate, but in a way where they're holding your boundaries. In your book, um, you talk about, so there's the concept of the golden rule. And you expanded on that and said uh, that your family goes by the platinum rule. Could you explain uh, why you felt like the platinum rule was needed a little bit more than the golden rule and how that shows up in your family and how we as parents in Washington Township could ad adapt those principles? Yeah, well, you know, most of us know that golden rule, treat people the way you want to be treated. And I think generally that's a good rule of thought, right? You can't, you can't argue with that in, in some senses, right? It's good to introduce our children to that. But I think the problem with the golden rule is that it centers self. So it doesn't really think about other people's lived experiences. It doesn't really think about other people's cultures or the their ways of being and knowing. Um, it really tells children that the way that they feel right, themselves is the right way or is the normal way or is the way that somebody else should feel. So I think the platinum rule is really about treating people the way they want to be treated. And this requires us to get to know people. It requires us to get out of our safe bubbles. It requires us to think beyond ourselves. Um, it requires us to see other people's perspective um, and to acknowledge somebody else's lived experiences. So the platinum rule really requires us to expand our thinking about each other. And studies show, and we know that the more we get to know people who are different from us, the more we realize they're not that different from us, right? It, it lowers the fears about others, which is we see that um, creating fear right now in our world, right? Where we're so divided is a way to keep the walls up. And so I think the more we start to think about how do I treat somebody the way that they need to be treated, it really gets us to put those walls down to expand our thinking around um, other people and how they feel and who they are. And um, it really is a better way that we can kind of create safe spaces for everyone where everybody feels valued and um, like they belong. 
So you just talked about fear. Um, and there's a part in the book uh, where you talk about um, in the open dialogue section where you talk about that fear often prevents us from speaking to our kids about ideas like this. But you suggest reframing that fear and thinking about what happens if you don't have the conversations with your kids. Can you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, because listen, they're getting messages. We can put them in a bubble. We could be silent. We can pretend it's not um, existing. We can want to protect them all that we think we can. But the bottom line is our children are getting those messages from the outside world. And if you stay in your fear, right, of not wanting to see that or not want to talk about it, you are allowing our, your children to create their ideas of the world based on what they're hearing from outside our homes. And that's why, you know, going back to the core values, it's really important that we create those core values in our homes so that when our children are hearing things outside of the, of, uh, you know, on their phones or in social media or with their friends, you know, let's bring it back to our core values, right? How does that align with what we feel in our house? How does that align with the core values? Where is their mismatch? What do we think about that? Having these open conversations about it. Um, again, the more we talk, the more we unpack things, the lower the fear becomes. And I think if you're holding on to the idea that I'm going to protect my children, um, you are allowing the outside world to really dictate what your kids learn. And if you're okay with that, then those fears may work for you. But if you think about that, um, my kids are getting these messages from somewhere and it may not be me if I'm not having those conversations. In your book, I really appreciated how you talked about sometimes how we overparent our kids because we want them to do well. We want things to be perfect. We're going back and we're getting the book they left behind. Um, but you talked about how that takes away from their ability to have natural consequences and learn to advocate for themselves. So what tips do you have for parents who, on one hand, want the best for their children in the world, um, but um, need to kind of let the reins off a little bit so they can grow into those advocates, not only for themselves, but um, later on for others. Yeah, th th and this is hard. <laughs> I can't tell you how many homework papers I took to the school, how many lunch boxes, how many um, pairs of cleats because they forgot them for, I, I mean, I've done it, I've done it. And you know, I have to sit on my hands to still not do it. It is not easy because we want, we want to make life easy for our children. But in making life, e two things, two things. In making life easy for our children, right? They don't, they don't develop the decision-making skills, the responsibility that they need to be able to really make decisions in their own lives, right? The other thing is there are studies that show when kids are either overparented or helicopter parented that they also don't develop compassionate, compassion and empathy skills because life has revolved around them. They don't get to see sufferings of others in the same way. And so by doing these things, we're not only creating kids who don't know how to make decisions, right? Or don't know how to become organized or to, to learn to lean on them, leaning count on themselves, but we are also creating children who are not as compassionate and empathetic to people around them whose circumstances are different. So again, this is where, uh, you know, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow, right? You get to choose the things that you're saying no to. Um, you may want to start off when things are like low stakes, you know, and then uh, once those low stakes things have been mastered, then you have to choose the things that are a little bit like medium stakes. Like, you know, if my child left um, a homework assignment, that's not graded, you know, that may be something that I'm gonna choose to not, not, not take to him. Um, if, if he has uh, forgotten a, a pair of socks, maybe, maybe he'll, he'll have basketball practice without socks and then he'll learn, right? So we have to allow some natural consequences to happen. Um, and I think, having, uh, again, intentional conversations with our kids about what self-advocacy looks like, right? Knowing your needs, right? Teaching kids to know who they are, what, what are their strengths, what are areas that they need support in, um, and then teaching children to ask for that support, 
What is asking for that support looks like? If you know you have a hard time staying organized, instead of me doing your backpack for you, or instead of me having to bring you things every, every other day, what does support look like for you in having your backpack organized? And then the other thing to that is developing a team around your children. Okay, so who at school can help you stay organized? Who, what, what can, uh, who can you count on to do X and Y for you in a way that is sustainable and that makes sense towards your growth? So I think having these conversations, being explicit about what they look like, and you know, the bottom line is too, we have to model those things for our children. Just showing them and talking about, I mean, just talking about it is not enough. We have to really show them in the way that we show up every day and the way that we live our lives. And when we don't do something right, having those kind of outside our body talks where things that we would normally say inside, we need to have them outside so our kids can see the process, the thinking process that goes on when these things happen. Um, I left my gym shoes, forgot to put them in my bag. I got to the gym and didn't have shoes. That made me so angry because I finally got to the gym. What can I do for myself to make sure that um, I don't forget my gym shoes next time. Maybe I will write a to do a, a list uh, at night, and then I'll I'll be able to check off all the things that I put in my bag. Maybe I can put them in my bag at night. That way, in the morning when I'm rushing, I don't have to think about it. Maybe I'll have an extra pair of shoes in my car, so when I do forget, I have a backup plan. So by our children watching us have some reasons and some ways of coping and decision making. Um, it then can then help them to create some of those decision-making strategies on their own. Yeah, in the book, you talk a lot about this. You talk a lot about the different conversations that you have with the kids and the different ways that they act. And you even kind of talk about the fact that sometimes they don't treat each other the way you want them to treat each other. And, and you have to kind of just take a step back and, and realize that they're just kids being kids trying to figure this all out in the world, right? And so the question I have is, how do we kind of navigate that kids are just being kids idea without slipping into the really dangerous boys will be boys type conversation? That is a really great question. And it's a question that I've never been asked. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much for asking that question. Um, I think allowing our children to behave in age appropriate ways um, that may not be positive, right? should go without punishment or shame, right? Because it's age appropriate. Allowing children to behave in ways that hurt, silence, uh, dehumanize others is unacceptable. So, I mean, all of our children have done something, said something that we didn't like, we didn't condone, or just kind of straight up flat out embarrass us, right, in public. I think we've all had those moments. But it's the moment right after that, immediately following that, that really matters, right? And that stays with our children. Uh, sometimes we do something with our kids and we forget about it and we move on, but it stays with our kids, right? It stays in the memory of their bodies. Um, so in that moment right after our kid has done something that doesn't align with, with our core values, um, you need to think about how you respond Will it trigger you uh, based on your own traumas and, and, and childhood? Am I reacting because of my own fears? Um, will I be able to breathe through it and reflect on, on my actions before I talk to my kid? So I think having kids have space, safe spaces where they can grow, they can learn, they can be curious, they can make um, mistakes is highly encouraged, right? That's when I say kids will be kids. I mean that. They do age appropriate things that are developmentally okay, but they still need guidance around it, right? The not guiding them or finding compassion or centering our core values around those mistakes really can be detrimental to them. And so when we slip into that boys will be boys things, those are the things that we have to have those open dialogue around. We have to have those conversations about uh, our core values and how they align with some of these things that um, are, you know, kind of get you off balance and, and need the need to come back to your, to the GPS. 
you've spoken a lot about um, your family's core values. Can you take us through if I'm a parent and I'm listening to this right now and I'm like, my family doesn't have core values. Like what do, how do I go about this? Could you explain how your family came together to create these core values? Do you keep the same core values each year? Like how often do you um, change your core uh, values um, in your family? All great, I mean, these are really good questions. And I, these are questions that people don't usually ask me. <laughs> so I really appreciate um, the, the thought behind these questions, honestly. Um, I think my family, the way we did it, we did it dur during family meetings. So we would, and during our family meetings, we usually, on Sundays is usually when we had a, uh, family meetings, we'd have dinner and then we'd do some kind of game night or something. And then we'd have a, a like a 30 or 45 minute family meetings. And when your kids are a little bit older, I would say even five and up, four and up, they can really participate in creating core values. Like, what do you think is important to us? What, what um, value do you think when you leave the house and you're grown and you're on your own, what things do you think you've learned in our house that you would take with you that's really important, right? So I think writing them down, like having a um, brainstorming session around them, um, having kids have input to what is important um, is, is really helpful because the more buy-in the children get, right, the more they, they'll stick with it and the more important it would be to them. Um, so I think having some dialogue around what, what do we think our core values are, what's important to us, let's have this list of things, um, you know, maybe come up with 10, 10 items and then say, okay, it, are there any things here that we can kind of put together are there any things here that are more important than others? And getting back to your question of will they change? They may change, right? Because if you're doing creating core values with your children when they're young, children's, children may think something is important, but as, as they grow up, they start developing, they start to become pre-teenagers. Um, we realize that this X is more important, uh, maybe not Y. But there should be one or two core values that you create right from the beginning that is something that will be a through line um, to the time your children leave your house. But I think having dialogue around, and then once we created our core values, we would recite them. Really, we talk about them to open up every family meeting. We would put it on the refrigerator when we were learning them so that they were visible and intentional. Um, sometimes when I'm screaming at my children, my kids will say, uh, you know, you're not, that doesn't align with our core values. So they're able to respectfully call me on that, those core values. So there's created a safe space where everybody can um, make sure that we all stay on, on, on task and on track with our core values. So I think really being intentional about creating them with your family, writing them out um, and returning to them consistently. So when your kids become teenagers and they start missing curfews or they started doing teenagery things, you know, it's like, okay, hey, does this align with our core values here? Like, these are the things that we said are important to us. How is what you're doing um, aligning or not aligning with what, what, what we said is important? And what do we need to do to get back on, in alignment? I just love how honest you are with us. It's so similar to the tone that you used in the book, just giving us this advice, but also just saying, yeah, like every once in a while, I do raise my voice, right? And they're going to comment. I just love that. So as you develop these core values, um, uh, one of the things I think I appreciated most about the book is that you give us so many entry points into doing the work of social justice parenting or engaging in the community or um, taking action in outside of our homes. And so I think that what I found interesting was that sometimes it was just as simple as smiling at a stranger, but then you go all the way to the children's crusade, right? Where children are marching and they're being jailed, right? And so I think there's just this huge gambit. Can you talk a little bit about the various forms of advice that you gave um, and what your goal was in diversifying those examples? Yeah, I, th I think it's because we're all in different places in our journey, right? And we're all entering the work of parenting or activism um, based on our own lived experiences, based on our own traumas and our childhood um, and based on how comfortable we are, right? If our parents didn't talk about these things 
or do these things with us as as children, it may be a little bit more uncomfortable, a little bit harder to do to start these things with our own family. So, um, you know, I one thing that I stress is there's no right way of doing it, right? The really to me, the only wrong way to do it is not do do anything at all, right? So we all want to we we want to be active, um, and we have to start. And um, I the idea of having this gamut in the book is me trying to meet readers where they were. Um, and I wanted everybody to know where they are today is right where they should be. And that through radical love, reflection, reflection open, active hope, um, action, that we could take small steps or giant leaps, right? Whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, and it gets us closer to being more compassionate and more engaged human beings. And I think people sometimes think that activism or social engagement is this huge thing that other people do, but there really are the small things that we can do in our own homes with our children. Um, the way that we show up for our, our children in our home is, is huge um, because the, what, what we read to our children, um, the way we talk to our children, the way we model for our children are all part of uh, the journey of being an activist or being socially engaged. So I, I, I really think the important message was to start where you are and where you are is perfectly fine and it's perfectly where you should be. But I think also leaning into that idea that it's going to feel uncomfortable pushing yourself a little bit or pushing your children a little bit. And that's OK, too. Um, lean into that discomfort a little bit. Um, and uh, you will soon find that that becomes comfortable and it's time to lean in a little bit more. But um, I think in the, in the book, I, I put it into two categories and the categories are not that one is more important than the other, but it's more on, these are kind of quick things that we can do to um, be a part of a social engagement. And these are things that require more time and more energy. So the, the category one would be things like, um, you know, maybe volunteering, maybe uh, awareness raising, you know, where we, we, we wear pins or we go do walks or marches uh, um, to raise awareness of, on a cause or an issue. Um, internet activism, where I know back when uh, 2020, when George Floyd was murdered, uh, a lot of white influencers either did the blackout on their um, social media page or they you know, gave the mic to someone else, uh, a person of color for the week or whatever. So that's kind of what international, internet activism is. Or you know, signing petitions. We always see these petitions that are going around about causes and issues, you know, proactively signing those things, um, talking to your kids about why you're signing them and what it means, always having that dialogue. Um, those are category one. So they're pretty simple, they're pretty easy. They don't take a lot of effort, but they're still ripples, right? And then category two are more things like being thoughtful in letter writing, um, showing up to school board meetings, right? Having, getting on the agenda there, um, being a part of demonstrations and boycotts and rallies and things like that could be more category two. Again, not that they're more important, but they require you to plan more, to have more interaction with others. Um, and it requires, you know, time, more time and energy. So start where you are. Um, the key is just m moving in your journey and taking action. In your book, you talk a lot about the power di dynamic because earlier you talked about how you raise your voice. I think all of us parents who are here have found ourselves in that situation. But you also had an example in your book where you talked about one of your sons and when you realized that, you know, your family is like an athletic family and your one son, that's not the path he had. And you talked about you really have to get to know your kids and not the life you had planned for them. So can you talk a little, because a lot of your book, you talk about not centering yourself. And sometimes as parents, we center our ideals, our, our beliefs, maybe things we didn't have when we were a kid. So we're trying to prepare our kids um, to do these things, but that may not align with who they are as a person. So can you talk a little bit about uh, more about why you felt the need to include that in your book and then how we as parents can get to better know our kids and to ensure that we are helping them become the person they're supposed to be and maybe not so much the person we wanted them to become. Yeah, and I honestly, uh, sitting in this vulnerability right here, that is where I made the most of my mistakes as a mom. Um, 
what and I and I'll talk about my son in a minute, but with my daughter who um, had some battles with depression uh, as a young woman, uh, late high school, first year or two of college. Um, and when we start having dialogue around what what it was, what you know, what what I could have done differently, um, because you know, as a mom who prides herself, whose passion, whose work is all around belonging and um, safe space, um, I felt like, what did I miss with her? And she's my oldest. She she was saying that you know in our effort to give her opportunities that we didn't have, right? We put her in soccer, in ballet, in uh, softball, in basketball, in piano, all the things. Um, she internalized that as I need to be good at all these things, right? Um, or, you know, talking about her grades. So, you know, the, the pressure she felt when we thought, oh, we're giving you all these opportunities, how lucky are you? She felt like, oh my God, you know, they're, they're spending this money on this thing or uh, they, they expect me to be good at all this stuff. And it really impacted her mental health. And so that is, was really like eye-opening for me to know that the thing that I thought I was doing uh, as something positive was really something that could hurt my children. Um, and then my one son, uh, my second son, he is my one kid that doesn't play sports, which, you know, we come from this, we are a sports family. Um, and he was like, I don't want to play. And we were like, you, you'll like it. You'll like it. <laughs> Just play. But he likes fishing. He likes science and animals and anime and Yu-Gi-Oh and all those things. And it was so foreign to me. And I had to step back as a mom to say, this is who my kid is. And I am trying to make him something that he is not instead of hearing him and supporting him in who he is. And so I think sometimes we, uh, and, and part of it is our fear too, right? Um, I know if my kids play sports, they'll stay in good shape. They'll, it'll delay them from doing other stuff that teenagers do. So part of that was my fear, fear-based parenting. And so I think we have to date our children. We have to take them out one on And you know, it's not easy. I know with time, I have five children. So that was very difficult. But when you we take a time, it doesn't have to be anything elaborate. It can be an hour with just you and one child to really listen, like create safe space where they could talk about who they are, um, what their fears are, what they think their strengths are, what they're loving, what's making them happy right at that moment. Um, and so I think it's a great way to, to put in activities or put in time and practices where you can really get to know who your kids are and not project who you think they should be or what you think is good for them. Because sometimes what we think is good for our children is really not what's good for them. And sometimes we have to listen to them telling us what they think is good for them. And you know, a lot of times they're right. So we also have to, you know, kind of get our egos out of the way and really kind of lean into getting to know who our kids really are. Thank you. There's some comments in the chat. People are just so grateful for your vulnerability and, and the power of your words. And oh, so I just you. want to make sure that you have a chance to see some of those things that. that people are saying um, about you and your work. Um, as I look through the list of uh, people who are in, in this session right now, a lot of them are parents, obviously some community members, but there's also a lot of educators um, in the list of, of, of attendees. And so Right now, there's a lot going on at school board meetings all over the country, and people are talking about critical race theory and banning books and all these other ideas. And a lot of teachers um, are really kind of scared of things they can do and things they can't do, even if it's not happening in their state or in their township. So I'm kind of wondering if you could answer a question that hits at both the parent and the teacher, like, what's your advice for teachers in that setting? But also, what are what can we do as parents to support teachers in all of this work? Yeah, that, you know, and I, I am an educator and right now I am in teacher education at, at my local university. And I have a lot of angst around this. I have a lot of um, conflict with trying to teach future teachers 
what to do, what to say, how to show up in schools with what's really going on in the world. And as a new teacher coming out of the teacher edu pro education program, what does that really look like for them? Um, and it's been very difficult because I teach, I teach literacy courses where my classes, I put in, of course, all the banned books in my courses, but I also teach um, multicultural education, um, cultural responsive teaching courses, which, um, and I live in Florida, so there's that. Um, but I think this idea of fear-based parenting, fear-based teaching, it's all escalated by this fear-driven fear politics. Um, and the first thing I would say to teachers um, is, my dear teachers, <laughs> that I see you. I, my heart is so, um, I don't know, sad may not be the right word, but my heart is feeling for you, all the feels, right? Um, and I want to thank you for loving on our babies. I want to thank you for nurturing who they will be. Let me try not to cry because I believe in the power of teachers. I believe um, in the differences that you make in the lives of, of, of kids. And often, sorry, the kids that need you the most right now are the kids that are being kind of wiped out of our curriculum. Um, they are the kids that need the representation and they are the ones that are getting it the least or feeling the, the aftermath of a lot of the mandates that are going on. Um, so I think from a practical lens, and this is what I'm doing with my own students, um, it's to really make sure that you're reading any of the new mandates that are coming down. Like, I put that in my curriculum that you read, like there's so many teachers that have not really read it, right? They, they've heard what's being said. They're seeing what people are saying. They're reading newspaper clippings of a summary of it, but they've not really read the mandates. So the first thing I would say to you is if there's any mandates or there's any um, new laws that are out right now in your area that causes you to rethink about the way that you're teaching, right? That is less inclusive, right? Or, or, or less safe for some students or don't tell students the whole truth. Read those mandates and really um, kind of own the language around that. And then I have what I have my students do, my graduate students who are teachers, to look at the mandates and then look at the standards for our, for our state. And really when you look at them side by side, there is some room in there that you can navigate. Because the language sometimes is very vague, you can use that language in a way that supports your students um, with the way that you show up. So I think really knowing the mandates, really look at the standards and see where there could be wiggle room that you can still teach the way that you teach, but it still follows the mandate. So look for key terms and key words that kind of can help you to maybe find space in the gaps um, that can really um, make sure that you are reaching all the students in the classroom. And, and like I said, I, I'm, I'm living in Florida and there's a lot of things going on right now with our politics. Um, but even in our language, that's really heavy, um, you know, anti-CRT, anti-LGBTQ curriculum, um, we are really finding ways that there are Loopholes is not the right way, but there are gaps that we can say that we're teaching this thing based on um, something that was kind of left out in the mandate. So I, I, I'd say kind of be a detective around those things to see where you can find space um, because students need you to teach. They need you to teach about the real world. And, and, and uh, I think it was John Dewey's in his Foundation of Democracy, he talks about classrooms being a microcosm of the whole world, which seems very scary right now. Um, but if we're truly trying to teach students to be citizens of tomorrow and have them, we have to teach these very complex things, right? This in a multicultural diverse world that our kids are living in and will be running, right? In 10 years that, um, it's kind of our, to me, our civic duty as teachers uh, 
to really try to be as open as you can about things that are going on in the world. Um, and I think it's really important. But I also think as parents, we have a duty too, right? To support our teachers. We have to go be before these school boards. We have to go into our administration um, and say, these are the things that are important to us. It's important that we keep books on, on shelves. It's important that kids see themselves in the literature that are in our libraries. Um, it's important that you know that these are my choices, right? Because sometimes the people who want more inclusive ways of being and showing up are not as vocal about it. And so I think going to, to your administration, going to the school board is great. I think it's even better when you go as a collective, right? If you have three or four families who can make an appointment with the administration at your school or the school district and say, I just need you to know that these things are, are important to me. I need you to know that um, it's important that my children have access to these things. It's important that um, teachers know that we support them teaching, um, you know, to all of these topics, to all of these children. And I think I would also like to say to parents is, um, how are you having these discussions at home, right? How are you, what are you reading with your own children? How are you teaching your children to respond when things are going on in schools? How are you modeling for your children the things that you want them to stand up for? Um, and how are you supporting teachers? Have you reached out to your teacher and say, I acknowledge you, I know it's hard. Write them a note to, so they don't feel like they're alone. Um, let them know that you recognize things are difficult and ask them, what can I do as a parent to make things better for you? Um, letting your teachers know that you appreciate them, I think can go a long way right now. And then the final thing I would say to teachers and to parents is go vote, right? And take five peoples with you, five people with you. I think it's important that we make our voices heard through our voting and um, making sure we're we're active in supporting candidates that support more inclusion, um, more diversity, more uh, teaching history the way that it happened. Um, and I think if we are not voting and we're not uh, taking action, right, no matter how small the steps, we're taking actions, things are going to keep slipping away from us and that for, for people who really want to make sure that all lives are being included in the curriculum um, and all children feel safe and supported. Keeping along the uh, same train um, as Dr. Fleshner mentioned about um, parents and teachers being on this webinar right now, in your, and you wear many hats, but in your book, um, there was a part where you uh, had your educator hat on and you were talking about a particular student in your class. And so thinking about um, teachers as well as parents, um, I'm hearing a shift in language from equity and inclusion to equity and belonging. So can you talk a little bit to teachers about the students who sometimes need the most love, how we can foster a sense of belonging for those students in the classroom? And then how can we as parents help with that sense of belonging at home? Because thinking about um, your vulnerability and how you shared about your daughter, sometimes we think we are creating that sense of belonging at our home and sometimes we are missing the mark. So could you talk to both teachers um, and parents about how can we um, create this sense of belonging and how do we check in to know that we're you know, getting it right or maybe we are getting a point that we're not getting it right? Yes, I, and I think uh, we have to ask. <laughs> we can't assume. We have to ask kids, what do I need to do to make sure you know that you matter? What do I need to do to make sure that you know that you're important to me and that you belong in this space? Um, I think where we go wrong sometimes is that we are creating belonging or trying to create spaces of belonging through the, our own lens, right? So it goes back to that idea of decentering ourselves. Um, and I think we have to be proactive with really getting to know our children, getting to know our students and finding out about their lives, um, where they come from, and what um, makes them feel safe, what makes them feel like they are included. Um, and I think inclusion is, it's, it's different from belonging, right? Belonging is this, this feeling, right? This um, community that you create 
where kids can feel like they can breathe, right? Inclusion is about the representation of who they are in that space um, and that your curriculum and your instruction matches um, the, the feelings that you're trying to create with, with your students. So um, I think we need both. Um, but I think we can't make assumptions that we know what that feels like and what that looks like. I think we should ask children. And then when I look at it from the lens of home, because our children, when they grow, um, their needs change, what made them feel safe and, and, and um, the sense of belonging as a eight-year-old is going to be very different when they're a 15-year-old. Um, so I think really thinking about the age and the stages and what your children are and then checking back in with them. How, how are we doing, you know, getting, getting a gauge on the, on the temperature of where they are, what's important to them. Um, I think creating actual physical spaces in classrooms and homes is really important. Um, sometimes kids just need to be in a place that they can just exhale, right? So creating a corner in a classroom, creating a space in, in your home, talk to your kids, talk to your students about what does that space look like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? What can we do to know that when you're having a hard day or you need five minutes, um, you can go to that space and you're safe and nobody can bother you. Um, I won't, I won't say anything. I don't want to, I won't talk to you unless you need me to. Um, but that's your time to exhale. Um, also, I know as teenagers, uh, my kids had safe words. So if they call me and they didn't feel safe or they wanted to leave, they had a word that they would say to me on the phone. And I knew that meant I need to come pick them up or I need to give them kind of a, a, um, an out saying that they need to come home because we had an emergency at home or whatever that, that, that is. So I think creating safe spaces is a great place to really start this idea of belonging in our homes and in our schools. So our kids know that they are heard, they're seen, um, and that they're valued in, in the decisions that we make um, in our classrooms and in our homes. Um, Dr. Baxley, we thank you so much for just spending time with us this evening. We appreciate you, your book, your vulnerability with us, you know, as a parent, you know, first, <laughs> this is just such a refreshing dialogue to just hear you know, other parents really leaning into a critical conversation about humanity and how we help our students to get acclimated to conversations around justice. So I really do appreciate you. I appreciate our community coalition members who are able to help organize this to Shante Barnes, as well as Ryan Flesner. I appreciate your facilitation, but thank you everyone who's able to stick around for a few minutes after time to hear this conversation. It was so powerful. The words are so important and meaningful. And I just thank all of you for being a part of this experience. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.